Welcome to Friends of Europe's Critical Thinking Live. Today, our hot topic is entrepreneurship and skills and improvement of SMEs into the future. And we look at how the cornerstone of Europe's economy, which are SMEs, can be supported to be strengthened, adapt, and, and I suppose mitigate the, the crisis that they were undergoing, but also to make sure they're part of our future economic recovery. As ever, with our Critical Thinking Live, we bring you decision makers, influencers, and those who matter to the topic of the day. Um, I have a commissioner, uh, a major international platform, a uh, social media platform, and an investor of, of, of some scale. So we have Commissioner Nicola Schmidt, we have Karen Massam from, uh, from Google, and then we have Alain Godard from the European Investment Fund. And in between these conversations and discussion, we're going to show you examples of how SMEs have adapted to the circumstances they find themselves in, especially in the context of uh, the lockdown, but also the associated economic crisis. And of you, and as many of you all know, SMEs have suffered the, the, the vast, uh, you know, incre incredible circumstances of not being able to operate and having to be underpinned by public taxpayers' money. What we do know, though, is that the SME sector is by far the largest employer of ordinary people across Europe. It is by far the largest sector that matters in terms of our eco economy. And it's absolutely certain and key that if we don't protect support and enable uh, the SME sector to uh, adapt, not only to digitalization, but to new economic models and respond to the e economic interests of Europe, we're simply not going to be comp competitive, but we're also, we're gonna create incredible job losses. But what we need to do is think about how do we turn that round? So firstly, I'm very pleased to introduce Nicola Schmidt, who is commissioner for uh, jobs and social rights, broadly. Nicola, very good to have you with us. Hello. Hello. Good, morning. good to have you with us, Nicola. Tell us, I'm going to be really kind of very direct with you. What is it you're doing that's going to ensure that SMEs are supported and we have a, an approach from the Commission that focuses on upskilling and creating the right skill set for the future? Well, uh, I think you, you put it very rightly. Uh, the uh, SMEs who are the backbone of the uh, European economy have particularly suffered, or at least uh, a majority of SMEs from this crisis. And uh, we have, uh, at European level, as well as at national level, made a lot of efforts to support uh, SMEs in order to allow them first to survive, to keep their personnel, to keep their workforce, and to adapt to the new uh, uh, economic uh, circumstances. Just a word on uh, what we did. We, uh, we assured their solvency, uh, we supported uh, them financially, but also through a program called SURE. Uh, we allowed them to keep their, their staff uh, through uh, uh, short-time work models, and that was uh, one, uh, 100 billion euros being spent just to keep jobs, and mainly also jobs in SME. So this was uh, just uh, to, uh, uh, to face the, uh, the, the crisis. But now we have seen also that in, in this crisis, uh, things have changed very, very rapidly. Technology has accelerated, uh, especially through digitalization. And here I think it's now, uh, how can we best support SMEs to adapt to this technological revolution, uh, mainly the, uh, uh, the digital one, but also the green one, because we are now with the Green Deal pushing very much uh, in the direction of more uh, green technologies. And this means that not just uh, SMEs have to invest more, but also they have to invest into their workforce, into their employees. And here uh, we have put into place the skills agenda, very focused on the digital and the green revolution, uh, also the possibility to so support SMEs financially, because we all know big companies have the uh, financial surface mm -hmm. uh, to retrain, to reskill, to upskill their workforce. SMEs sometimes have more difficulties. So, and for them, it is as vital to invest in their, in their workforce. So the skills, the upskilling, the reskilling, the training is uh, of essence for SMEs. And here, as I said, we have, we, we have uh, 
the um, uh, skills agenda, but we also insist a lot on vocational training. SMEs are, for, uh, for many young people, the, the, the place where they can find a job, especially uh, through vocational training. So the Commission has pushed a lot uh, in the direction of vocational training, especially for the young, but also uh, for those who have to uh, adapt to a, a changing working uh, environment. We launched, by the way, the Pact for Skills, which is not just for the big companies, it's also for the smaller ones. And by the way, the smaller could be supported. Uh, very often they, uh, uh, they are in the value chains also of bigger companies. They can be supported also by s bigger com companies uh, in, their, in their skilling efforts. So I think mm. the skills agenda is crucial for entrepreneurship. It's crucial for SMEs. It's crucial for the recovery, a sustainable recovery, a durable recovery, and a fair recovery, by the way. Indeed. Nicola, just to make it clear for most of our, our audience here, we are talking about SMEs which are in the most, in the most, under 250 employees. Most are in the region of 100 to 150, if that. As you say quite rightly, they are the first entry point for a lot of young people who have not been in school or, or in higher education. They're not, you know, they are the entry point for the vast majority of the population in Europe who are not in the top 10% of getting university, Erasmus, etc. How do you make sure you reach into the those small SMEs? What's the plan to actually really get the money into the places it needs to be in? Who are you going to work through? How will it, will it happen at member state level or will it happen through intermediaries, intermediaries uh, uh, Europe-wide? Well, first, uh, we, we launched a, a, a new SME strategy. And uh, because we are aware, as you said, that uh, SMEs are crucial for the European economy, for jobs, but also for innovation, by the way. A lot of uh, new startups are SMEs. They start as small companies. Uh, that, that's about uh, also supporting entrepreneurship uh, in Europe. And this is uh, done through, uh, can be done through European funds, being channeled through uh, mainly through, uh, uh, through member states, but also uh, support uh, from the uh, European Investment Bank and the, the different uh, instruments uh, at the disposal of the European Investment Bank. We have InvestEU, where uh, uh, funds can be channeled through SMEs, but I think uh, Alain can better uh, uh, deal with this uh, issue. But what is important that also uh, the not so material investment is supported. And this mm. is about skilling. And uh, uh, here we have to support SMEs even more than big companies, because as I said, SMEs sometimes, they do not have the resources Indeed. to invest more in the reskilling of their labor force. And this is crucial for their future. Absolutely, because most SMEs don't have the opportunity to close their business for a day to do training of staff. And that's one of the issues for many of them, is that how they balance that kind of the agenda for development whilst making sure if your bar, your restaurant or your large, you know, uh, um, or let's say small factory can't close for the day for training. But, you know, let's come back to that. I'm sure people have questions around how we make that happen. But thank you for addressing those, that question. My final point, I suppose, to you, and we'll come back to you in the Q&A, is about the Porto Summit. Signal is a, you know, a very significant coming together, um, a, a real uh, combination of private sector, public sector entities. Everyone's looking at, you know, has that changed anything? Do you think that's been a, a marker in moving us towards a, uh, a pathway that's going to reduce inequalities? Well, I think it, it has been indeed a marker in, in, uh, in the... Uh, uh, in the evolution of the European Union, because I, I think the Porto Summit has clearly shown that there is no opposition between on uh, the economic side, the economic development and the social one. We have really to bring both together. And this is the message coming out of Porto, uh, and especially in a context of uh, uh, difficult uh, uh, social issues uh, caused by the pandemic, uh, uh, our health systems, uh, our education systems uh, were very, uh, very much affected by, by the pandemic. And I think the message coming out of Porto is uh, we will have a, a strong, competitive and especially also a resilient economy if we uh, invest 
in uh, social infrastructures, if we invest in skilling, reskilling, if we allow people uh, to transit from one job to another, uh, this is uh, the, uh, if we support the young. There's a strong message in the Porto conclusions on the young, and also poverty, inequality, and poverty are not socially uh, really. Uh, a danger for our society, for the cohesion of our society. They are bad for the economy. They are bad uh, for growth, for the future growth, for our growth potential. So investing in reducing inequality, reducing poverty, and this is one of the big targets of the Porto, uh, Porto uh, Summit uh, through, the, uh, uh, Porto, uh, through the action plan the Commission proposed. This is also good for the future, for better uh, a European society, but also for a stronger European economy. So I think there has been some game changer in Porto. Now this is a process. We have to work on it. We are working on it. We have already made a certain number of proposals in this context, especially on poverty, on inequality, better wages, the minimum wage proposal, but also fighting poverty at its uh, uh, source uh, the recommendation we made on child poverty and 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 really combating uh, child poverty in all the member states uh, those were who were less prosperous but also those who are prosperous and and nevertheless have a, a, a have a poor children so I think this is uh, uh, now a, an important process for Europe uh, uh, to strengthen Europe but at the end also to strengthen European societies. Indeed, Nicholas, fine words. And uh, you're quite right that uh, as we look at what's happened through the pandemic and we look ahead, we know that most young people in their, let's say, from the 18 to, let's say, late 20s are not going to be able to get in the job, uh, get in the housing market because they're outpriced. We do know that a lot of them will need reskilling, especially for those who come from poorer backgrounds and will need the, uh, the kind of escalator of support that we've never had before if Europe's to be competitive. But stay with us and I'll, I'll bring you back later. So thank you very much for what you've just contributed. And I think there's lots of food for thought in terms of the how. And I think that's always the, the issue. And the second point that occurs to me is that one of the things that we fail to do, not least policymakers, is not a criticism of you, but across the board, we fail to think about the risks or the shock absorbers that we need to put into place for policy making. And, you know, who'd have thought that we'd be blindsided by the pandemic and then the you know, subsequent economic crisis? You know, we are going to have more of this happening in the next 10 years. It's about how does this agenda incorporate a, risk, a shock absorber capacity to make sure that, again, young people aren't left out of education for a year and have the same opportunities that others do. But I'll come back to you on that. Karen, Karen, very, Karen Masson, very good, very good of you to join us. You're from Google. Uh, you are, let me just be really clear, the government, uh, head of EU uh, government affairs and public policy at Google. Very good to have you with us. Thank you. Uh, so you do a number of things at Google in terms of supporting SMEs. We're aware of that. You know, you're a high profile company that's been, you know, uh, subject to a lot of controversy in, in various ways. But today this is about understanding from your perspective twofold. There's two things I'm interested in. One is you, you, you know, in terms of the Porto summit, what's your view, Karen, in terms of, has it changed anything? Has it kind of, uh, as, as the commissioner said, Nicola said that, you know, it feels like a turning point as a large, you know, multinational, a huge, well-recognized platform for you. Did it feel the same way? Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we feel that, you know, it's not just about economic growth. It's about having an inclusion behind that growth. And this is why we fully stand, you know, behind the, the social summit, the commitment to have really diversity and inclusivity into this economic recovery so that we don't leave some people behind. I mean, since the start of the pandemic, we've been focusing on answering that our technology could actually help to narrow the gap, which unfortunately has widened, focusing on the skills and also on the jobs, you know, especially in the SMEs, as you were mentioning, which are absolutely vital for Europe. And um, especially as well, those who have been very disproportionately impacted uh, by the pandemic. If you look, you know, for instance, you know, the, uh, the future of work has not had the same impact. Some people like don't have college degrees. There are some ethnic minorities and also some women who've suffered the most across Europe. I mean, we can see that uh, women usually 
are nearly four times more likely to be disrupted than men. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of things we need to help. So one thing we've done, for instance, is that, you know, we've, uh, we've joined the, uh, the Pact for Skills from the Commission, and we've given a commitment to provide basically what we call our certificates into uh, learning some digital skills. We've provided that to 100,000 uh, people across EMEA, and 50% of this, uh, this number actually is allocated to uh, people who are into much more difficulties. And what we do is that we've also provided a grant of 5 million so that these people can also receive additional services to make sure they complete their training for six months. So they receive things like uh, carry advisors, interview preparation, childcare vouchers, and language support. And uh, we feel that we also need to address the barriers for entrepreneurship and job mobility. We've also invested into other initiatives like Google for Startup, Well and Wheel. So we invest into women founders. We also invest into the Europe's black community. And uh, we've also skilled, uh, you created a, for the first time for us, basically a skill week where we actually try to select a lot of uh, non-profits who are going to make a snowball effect and mentor thousands of uh, small businesses across Europe so that they can beef up their digital skills. We think, you know, there is a need for greater collaboration between the public and the private sector. And that's the way forward to, uh, to overcome these barriers. Karen, thank you for that. Can I just dwell a little bit on the certificates process? One of the key issues as we look at the future is that uh, the biggest um, or the hardest hit sector other than health authorities was our education system during the pandemic, right? We had kids, especially those who were not you know, from rich backgrounds or middle class backgrounds, had to you know, basically be in cramped spaces with no bandwidth you know, and no access to internet and then missing out of a, a, on education. So what is it that you're doing that helps in the certification process that's going to help, let's say, a child in Berlin or a young person in Berlin to be able to seek a job in Paris and vice versa or all around Europe? I know it's not your responsibility, but what would you like to see happen if the concept of anytime, anywhere education can be put into place? Thank you. Well, I think there's two things to say. I mean, the first one is that it's not only the people who are young, it is, but it's also across your life. Because what we see, I mean, we run a study recently with McKinsey, what we see that society is evolving. There are a lot of skills, you know, digital skills in particular, that people don't have because it's not necessarily provided into the current education because things are going so fast. So we're working, you know, with the commission and with other uh, partners so that we develop all of us what we call micro training. So you can be trained for like a short period of time to actually be learning skills which are going to be absolutely helpful for the current job uh, openings and that help you basically to, to find, you know, the skills that maybe you cannot find into a four-year education or maybe you cannot do because, you know, you actually have not done uh, these studies. So what we find is that there is a possibility to be much more flexible in terms of, you know, on the lab formation so that you can keep on learning and learning new things so that you match basically the needs, the evolving needs for the society and for the jobs. Okay, okay. But obviously, as you say, it's not just your um, responsibility. There's something about um, the EU's competence in education as well. Uh, and also, as we know, next year, uh, the President of the Commission has announced that, you know, we've got next year as a, you know, uh, the European Year of Young People or European Year of Youth. And, you know, that's going to be a key signal if it's not simply going to be flag waving, but something substantial that will address the education and training needs of young people. Um, from a perspective as, as, a, as a, tra a platform like yourselves, what is specifically you doing to support SMEs? Thank you very much. Well, you know, I think it's everybody's responsibility, you know, to, to go back to what you were saying. I mean, I think, for instance, we know a lot about technology and we find it's fundamental, you know, to understand how technology can support society and to bring people along the way. I mean, in terms of SMEs, we feel they are like the life of the European economy. So we have a special relationship with them. You know, we help them to scale, to innovate and to reach new customers. And we saw that, you know, during the pandemic when, you know, the, all the shops were closed to be able to understand when they could actually come or if they could actually sell online was actually quite important. And, um, but we need some innovative partnership. And I think innovation is important in education, but also in terms of how we support SMEs. So, for instance, we've partnered with EIF so that we could actually provide a 20 million investment into two funds. So 15 million in a loan that supports about 1,000 uh, European SMEs and also 10 million in life science fund to actually help all the companies, you know, like about 200 of them who um, actually help us, you know, on science during the COVID. 
But as I was saying before, you know, the skills are changing. So what we need to do is really be able to actually embrace it because technology will continue to play a very critical role and uh, we need able to, to help the people. So for instance, Indeed. what we're trying to do is really partner. So for instance, we work in France with Pôle emploi so that we can help, you know, the job ski, ski, uh, seekers identify the gaps they have in digital skills and the way to, ac uh, to access them. We're also working, you know, uh, in different countries like in Spain, where we partner with uh, different, you know, ministries as well in Portugal. So we actually try to, to scale up basically the digital capacity. Great. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much. Let's come back to some of that debate because obviously it's generating a lot of interest and discussion, I think, all round in terms of the fact that in the future, we know digital is going to fundamentally reshape how we consume, how we live, how we communicate with each other and how we work. Uh, and so therefore, it's, a, it's going to be a key facet of how we make sure we transition there safely, but in a just and equal way. And these are key questions for both not only government, but for the private sector in terms of your own accountability and responsibility for making a good society. Before we move on and um, bring in the European Investment Fund, I want to uh, uh, share with you some examples of how SMEs have adapted to the lockdown and in their economic circumstances and really kind of being able to mitigate the impact of the crisis but also thrive and innovate. So firstly, we're going to go to Lisbon and we have the founder of the Lusa Language School. Hi, my name is Andre. I'm the founder of Lusa Language School. We are a school specialized on teaching Portuguese as a foreign language. During the pandemic, one of the first measures that we felt straight away was that our school was closed. Because of that, we had to very quickly find alternative ways to teach our courses. We created new digital products, mainly online group courses. We had to pretty much train all the teachers how to use Google Drive to share documents with the students. It was a, a huge shift. Fortunately, we managed to be successful. We ended up recruiting more people. We managed to increase our sign-up by 4%. At the moment, we have this hybrid model, which uh, has the presential courses and the online courses. We are very happy that we can do this and that we can reach to people, not only that are in Lisbon, but also people that are based uh, all over the world. Now, we're going to move to Poland and we're going to have, listen to Moondot, Moondot in Poznan um, about knitted products for interiors. Cześć, nazywam się Kasia Schwarz, mieszkam w Polsce i prowadzę tutaj swoją firmę Moondot, w której produkuję takie właśnie rozmaite dziergane produkty do waszych domów, do pokoików dziecięcych. Na początku mojej działalności opierałam się na kontakcie bezpośrednim z klientem podczas rozmaitych targów wnętrzarskich, ale czułam, że muszę zrobić kolejny krok i tym krokiem było uruchomienie własnego sklepu w internecie. Gdy w Polsce pojawił się koronawirus, nauczyłam się analizować ruch na mojej stronie. Ludzie zamknięci w swoich domach, przyglądając im się z uwagą, zaczęli bardziej skupiać się na tym, jak te ich wnętrza wyglądają i to była ogromna szansa dla mojej firmy. Z tej szansy mogłam skorzystać dzięki kompetencjom cyfrowym nabytym jeszcze przed pandemią. Obecność w internecie daje poczucie bezpieczeństwa. Takie właśnie poczucie bezpieczeństwa mi i mojej rodzinie daje moja maleńka firma Mundo. We now turn our attention to Santorini and we're going to speak to Amantina Houses. Το Emantina Houses είναι μια πολύ μικρή οικογενειακή επιχείρηση που χτίστηκε με πολύ κόπο και αγάπη. Όταν η κρίση χτύπησε την Ελλάδα, οικογενειακώ βρισκόμασταν στην Αθήνα. Αποφασίσαμε με το σύζυγό μου να μεταπούμε στη Σαντορίνη και να φτιάξουμε κάποια κατεστραμμένα υπόσκαπα σε μια μικρή οικογενειακή επιχείρηση. Οι λίγε γνώσει μα πάνω στο διαδίκτυο και η μεγάλη βοήθεια που ήρθε ξαφνικά από την Google. Μα η την Αντιγόνη μας βοήθησε ούτως ώστε να αρχίσουμε να δουλεύουμε σωστά. Το βίντεο του Google για το Μαδίνα Χάουζεν βοήθησε την επιχείρηση παράλληλα με τα μέσα κοινωνική δικτύωση και τις πλατφόρμες κρατήσεων να γίνουμε ακόμα πιο γνωστοί. Μέχρι από το 2020 η παγκόσμια πανδημία επηρέασε σοβαρά τον τουρισμό και όλες τις συναντήσεις επιχειρήσεις. 
Βλέμοντα αισθητά τι τιμέ, στηρώντα ταυτόχρονα και τα υγειονομικά πρωτόκολλα, έχοντα αποκλειστικά πια προσωπική εργασία, λαμβάνοντα παράλληλα κρατική βοήθεια, διατηρήσαμε την επιχείρηση ανοιχτή. Σήμερα το 2021 ανοίγουμε τι πόρτε του Εμαντίνα Χάουζη για του νέου επισκέπτε μα. There you have three excellent examples of how, uh, in different parts of Europe, individuals have innovated, adapted, improved and thought through their circumstances and actually accelerated their development, but also made them ready, if you like, to be more uh, effective and prosperous into the future. So these are just three examples of the many millions I'm sure there are out there, but that's Those are the success stories, but those are also equally those who have not had the opportunity to do find the space or the pathways that we, we've just seen in our videos. I want to turn our attention now to an investor. So that's the European Investment Fund, and I'm really pleased to be able to welcome Alain Godard, the, the CEO there. Alain, very good to have you with us. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting us. No, it's a real pleasure. You are a fund of huge significance. There's a lot of money uh, that you, are, you spend uh, and you do a number of things across Europe. Tell us, from your perspective, given what we've heard so far, how, how are you at the EIF going to make sure that SMEs aren't look overlooked but a centrepiece of our economic recovery in Europe? Thank you. The, uh, actually, the SMEs have been in the centre of uh, our action from the start. And I'm quite uh, glad that you projected a few uh, videos uh, uh, in, uh, in, at this occasion, because uh, what we see on the, on the screen is a good example of how these SMEs have been able to adapt uh, already to, uh, to the crisis. And to some extent, this is a positive uh, news uh, out of the crisis, to adapt already to the digital world. And this is something that uh, we may underestimate that over the last 18 months, a lot has been done by SMEs, corporates in, in general, to adapt and anticipate the new uh, world of work. So EIF has been indeed uh, quite uh, key uh, so far in the, uh, in the support of these SMEs. You know that the EIF is the institution, the EU institution, Uh, in charge of, of supporting uh, SMEs, thanks to uh, our partners, uh, obviously the European Commission, the uh, European Investment Bank, but also the member states. And uh, what we have been I mean, uh, uh, doing so far is to complement with the programs that we have been de deploying uh, from the uh, European Commission, a member states and, and the bank, in order to complement the support uh, given by member states. And this has been quite uh, remarkable because uh, over a period of 18 months, we have nearly tripled our effort in, uh, in this field in, in, in support of, uh, of SMEs. So there's still a lot to, um, to, to be done. And uh, indeed, I mean, it's important to remind that uh, these SMEs represent 60% of the GDP in, uh, in Europe. Uh, nearly 90% of, uh, of the entities, uh, the corporates mm -hmm. in, uh, in Europe. And if we project ourselves a bit beyond the crisis, we would need, I mean, these SMEs to be a key partner in the transformation of our economy toward a greener and more digital uh, economy. So they are clearly at the center of our attention uh, in, in Europe and they will remain in the center of our attention in the future. Alan, so those are fine words, very good words. Tell us, in very specific terms, you've talked about the increase of uh, investment. What does that mean in practice? I mean, in terms of your model, so for our viewers, they understand there's a lot of money that comes through you, but how will it work in practice to reach SMEs in practice through member states, Um, the platforms, what is it? And, and, and also, when you think about digitalization, your money has to enable SMEs to not only be digital, but also green. So from our perspective at Friends of Europe, we're really clear there should be just one transition, a green and digital transition. How's your money making sure that happens? Okay, first of all, uh, we serve two types, I would say, of, um, of SMEs. Let's say the more traditional ones that uh, suffered the most I mean, during the crisis. And we provide for that guarantees instruments. So in other words, 
we allow, I mean, these SMEs to get concrete loans from their banks by providing them, you know, a guarantee to get access to financing. So this is extremely important for them because most of these SMEs, as you know, uh, miss, you know, uh, guarantees or, uh, or capacity, I mean, to provide any protection to banks. So this is, this is a, um, one way of serving this, these SMEs, uh, the most, I would say, traditional ones in all sectors. The second uh, support that, that we do, which is indeed uh, very much known in the market, is to support the, uh, uh, the, what we call the startups. Mm -hmm. And the EF is the biggest uh, investment uh, fund in Europe uh, supporting SMEs, so the most innovative uh, SMEs, uh, startups, through investment funds. So we invest indeed uh, quite massively into investment funds so that these funds are able to uh, grant equity uh, to these most innovative uh, uh, enterprises that cannot get uh, funds or uh, loans from, uh, from banks. And this is absolutely uh, important in the economy nowadays, not only you know, for, for these most innovative startups, but it's also very important for the most traditional ones who have been indebted, they were indebted before the crisis, they were even more indebted during the crisis, and the, the challenge for the future will be to support them in order for them to be still bankable and continue to invest into what you call the greener and the more digital transformation that is ahead of us. Indeed, thank you for that. I suppose the key issue will be, and we'll come back to that in the final comments, I suppose, is that how is your money more effective in terms of its pricing, in terms of its payback opportunity than, and its risk taking than the commercial lenders or some public sector lenders even? Because that's, that's one of the issues for the uh, SMEs is that the, the, the colour of money and the price of it can often be great, but actually the payback is too high. But let's come back to that in a moment because I want to now turn to uh, our, our next contributor. We have, a, uh, we have a contribution from Jake Ward, who is the president of the Connected Commerce Council. It's a membership organisation for small businesses empowered by digital tools and technology. Let's listen to Jake Ward. Hello, I'm Jake Ward. Before I started 3C, I believed that affordable digital tools and services could help small businesses grow faster and operate more efficiently. But the lesson we have all learned in the past 15 months is that digital tools, online services, and global marketplaces have provided tens of millions of small businesses with a safety net. Our recent digitally driven Europe survey of 5,000 small businesses captures this data and tells the story of European businesses able to survive and prepare to lead Europe's economic recovery. And I'm here today with a message from our members. As policymakers consider future regulations targeting large technology platforms, spend some time with the small businesses leveraging those tools and those services in order to serve their customers, their communities, and their employees. So there we have the voice of some, some sections of the SME sector and looking at digital tools, et cetera, and so forth. But turning back to, let's go back to Commissioner um, uh, Nicola Schmidt. Nicola, if I may, we've, we know that we have a ramping up of the various, what people are calling the fourth uh, or the fifth wave of uh, COVID, we know that there's a real cautiousness or a concern about inflation. And we know that when you combine those two things, it's the SMEs or those who are currently jobless or those on the job market that are going to suffer the most. As you look ahead to 2022, um, what, what, would, what are your reflections on what the EU can do in, in a short-term manner to provide uh, a support to those elements of the economy that are the most vulnerable to shock? Well, I, I think we have uh, launched an incredibly important program, which is called the Next Generation EU, or the Recovery and Resilience uh, Facility. Uh, and member states have prepared their plans. We are uh, about to start the, the financing of projects. This is extremely important. Uh, to uh, consolidate the recovery, which is strong, and uh, which uh, also should allow us to come through the very big uncertainty created by uh, the uh, surge of the pandemic, 
uh, and uh, which should also allow small and medium-sized enterprises as a means to adapt very rapidly. We have heard just now how small and, uh, SMEs can adapt through uh, especially digitalization. They were not ready when the pandemic started, many of them, and they got many of them ready uh, to uh, reconnect with their customers, their markets through digitalization, through e-commerce or other uh, digital, um, digital uh, possibilities. So I think we have now uh, to accelerate these processes in order uh, to make sure that the recovery will last. And I'm quite optimistic that it will. This means also that we have invested a lot in workforce because we see that in some areas we have labor shortages. Uh, we have, uh, on one hand, still relatively high unemployment rates and labor shortages. So this shows there are gaps uh, between uh, on the labor market and here. Uh, skilling, upskilling, reskilling is, is key uh, to make uh, sure that uh, companies who have to hire, they get the right people. Thank you, Nicola. There's, you know, there's a lot about the, uh, the Next Gen Fund. Obviously, it's the largest use of public taxpayers' money uh, that we've ever witnessed. And it's, it's the EU and the Commission operating in a way that it never has in terms of playing in the financial markets and is now become, let's say, a banker of member states in a, in a really interesting way. So it changes the power dynamic to a certain extent. Let's see what happens, obviously, in terms of the plans and their implementation in 2022. But when we've heard from these different experiences, there's data and there's trends, but there's experience. Do you feel you or people around you are sufficiently in touch with the everyday lives of SMEs to really understand the difficulties that they're experiencing or the challenges or the things they're looking out for in the future? And I know that's a challenging question, but it's an important, important one when we think about the use of the next-gen funding and where it comes from. Well, I, I think uh, we, we, we try our best to, to be in touch. And this is uh, extremely important uh, for the Commission and, and for the European Union as such, uh, to be in touch with uh, all the players, all the stakeholders, uh, and having this dialogue. And, and I can tell you, yesterday I had a dialogue with uh, social partners. Nearly every day I talk to employers, uh, to companies, uh, and this is, uh, this is a fascinant, uh, because we can only uh, make Europe also uh, 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 credible, strong, uh, and also give the, uh, give the right answers to the concerns of, uh, of uh, people, companies, uh, stakeholders, if we are in touch with them. Certainly, there's always margin for improvement, but I think uh, this Commission makes a lot of efforts in this, in this area. Nicola, thank you very much for responding to that question in that, in, in that frank manner. Um, Karen, turning back to you, in terms of, as I, you know, similarly, in terms of the next year, when we look at the unpredictability of shocks that we are going to witness, um, from your perspective, what, what more can you do, but what more do you want to do in partnership with government to respond to the potential shocks that affect the most vulnerable in our economy and, and SMEs can be that, but also young people entering the labour market. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think, uh, again, it's about working together. I think there are three things we can be doing together, you know, to really help drive the uh, economic recovery and also to go to the next stage. I mean, we need to drive digitalization in business by enabling access to low cost tools. We need to invest more in technology infrastructure and support the green recovery we were mentioning before. And then we need to help people get the skills they need for the future jobs and for the business to thrive. Very short and succinct. So that sounds like a perfect menu. Do you feel people are listening to that, to that, to that very clear agenda? Now, you're obviously going to say yes. I'd much rather you be much less diplomatic and just say, what are the challenges out there in the sector that you're experiencing? I mean, you are a big beast. But I'm thinking, you know, think about it in terms of what other players might be feeling or thinking when you say succinctly, succinctly, that's what needs to happen. What are we waiting Good. for? Good. I will not take it personal when you tell me I'm a big beast, but uh, I hear what Please you're saying, don't. basically. <laughs> 
Um, well, I mean, of course, it's not easy. I mean, we're talking about a huge transformation. But what we've seen with the um, actually with the COVID is that we've made a giant leap in terms of techn technological development. We had to shift a huge part of society. I mean, we saw because you know we're very near to the, to the SMEs because you know we work a lot with them. I mean, they're, they're, they're some of our customers, and what we see is that you know. We had people who just went out online. So I don't know, you look at your local pizzeria and everything. So suddenly they had to do it. And then, they, you know, we were trying to help them. So I think it's about making it happen together. But yeah, you're talking about, you know, some people who are selling macarons in the middle of France or people who are like the local shop. And it's about how we make it happen because it is very important for them. We've seen that, you know, with them, the uptake of digital tools, I mean, they succeeded, you know, to keep on the jobs, to actually keep on growing their business, finding new ways to, to find the customers. So this is very important. And yes, it's going to take time, but if you look at the European Recovery Fund, you know, which have been given, you know, everywhere, there's a huge part for really a digital commitment, you know, Indeed. for this infrastructure I was mentioning, but also for the skills, for the education, which has a big part of it. So providing the people the tools and the knowledge is something that is, is important and we're going to partner with. Excellent. So I've, I've not been as, a, you know, I, I was trying to be more positive than you would like maybe. Not at all. I just wanted you know, to get a sense of what the difficult uh, uh, realities are out there for a large, let me say, a large player, multinational out there in the field when you're trying to negotiate uh, to improve the circumstances for SMEs. Uh, but, you know, you've, you've, you've reacted, you know, you've responded well. I mean, there are these issues and we need to make sure that, uh, that the balance of um, financial support regulation but also foresight helps us move in the right direction and on that point so thank you karen on that point i want to go to back to alan alan um in a similar fashion i'm gonna i'm gonna be rounding up in a moment uh, but i want to hear from you in terms of what kind of um future foresight work are you doing at the eif to think about the rapid pace of technological change that's going to transform our societies. I mean, we don't know anything yet, but I think in the next five years, we're, it's going to, reality is going to bite, and we're perhaps not prepared for that reality, I feel. But how are you uh, going, what are you doing at the moment to think about that one green digital transition that's going to, uh, uh, you know, I suppose support those most vulnerable in the labour market and the economy? I think, as, as you said, I mean, it's um, it's not only about supporting, let's say, the most, uh, let's say, uh, fragile uh, in their capacity, I mean, for some of them still to survive, huh? uh, but it's also uh, about supporting them in their capacity to uh, stay afloat and to continue to invest into their transformation uh, to get to the new economy. Uh, again, we should not look at the, the situation as, uh, let's say, uh, dramatic as as, uh, as it could be. Uh, and, and again, I want also to take uh, advantage of uh, what you presented to us to, today uh, to say that many enterprises didn't wait for uh, support in order to transform themselves. So we should not underestimate, I mean, the, uh, let's say, effort that they, they are making. Obviously, they need to, to be uh, still accompanied uh, by uh, uh, by the financial industries, this is our role. And here, I mean, what we are designing is programs, not only let's say for the uh, let's say more the traditional uh, sectors and, and activities in uh, in Europe to transform, but we also support very much the the new enterprises, so the the, the startups, in order for for them to help the transition. We know that a lot of the, the, the transition will be conducted through uh, innovation. Innovation comes nowadays uh, mostly from uh, SMEs and from startups. There's a lot of innovation ongoing at the moment. And in Europe, we are designing programs to specifically target these uh, companies, which will help providing new technologies in order to precisely, I mean, in the domain of energy or uh, specifically, but not only, in order to make, let's say, our transition easier. Alan, thank you. Thank you all. I want to kind of just, uh, just round this off by uh, making reference to something that at Friends of Europe we are working hard on and have, have actually raised as an issue for some time, which is the notion of a renewed social contract for Europe.
And one of the things that we believe and have been working on is that when we think about the size of uh, public uh, taxpayers' money being used and has been used during the pandemic and currently, and when we think about next-gen EU funding, we know that that changes the relationship between public-private and what it means to the civil society sector, almost as if we need to rethink roles and responsibilities. And I just wanted to kind of, Nicola, if I may say to you, um, when you think about the next two years, the kind of concluding term of the current mandate, how does the notion of a social contract fit with your thinking? And very specifically there, I'm thinking that when you, when you realize that the majority of the private sector was underpinned and underwritten by public taxpayers' money, um, we've seen, we've seen uh, the scale and speed of change uh, that's been initiated, whether that's through a, a vaccine or building hospitals, etc. We've seen a very different change of an economy that we need to think about into the future. From your perspective, do we need to have a renewed social contract in Europe? Well, I, I believe in that, absolutely. Uh, that uh, we, uh, we are going, and, and the pandemic has even reinforced this, uh, through a change. Uh, and this is uh, a transformation of this dimension has not been known, uh, perhaps since uh, the first uh, industrial revolution. So we have the technology, we have the, the climate challenge, and this means that we have not just to change our economy using technology, investing in skills, but we need also to deal with these issues at a societal level in our societies. And this means indeed some kind of new social contract. Uh, for employment, for social services. And, well, you, you're always mentioning taxpayers' money. No, this is investment in the future of, peop of people. This is investing in the future of our kids. This is invest investing in a, the sustainability of the European economy and uh, also society. So I think uh, we need here some, uh, as you call it, a new social contract, uh, fairness is important, opportunities are important, entrepreneurship, so, certainly uh, enhancing entrepreneurship is part of that. So I, I believe that uh, we can grow stronger out of this crisis if we manage precisely to bring people together and as uh, I think Karine said, uh, uh, leaving no one, uh, no one behind, uh, also uh, reducing inequalities in our society. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad I, I posed that question to you. Colleagues, uh, Alain, Karan, thank you so much for being with us. I've run out of time, but I'm glad you said what you said, Commissioner, and, and we look forward to seeing the impact of those policies and those words as we look ahead to a, a even more uncertain future, colleagues, when we think about where we find ourselves in terms of COVID times, but also the uh, potential impact of inflation and uh, the rocky road ahead in terms of climate change post COP26. Um, I'm not sure we're dealing that well with our commitments to move ahead, but thank you all for joining us on our Friends of Europe's Critical Thinking Live and look forward to welcoming you again. Keep an eye on our website for our next set of events. But thank you to the three of you for responding to some challenging questions, but also um, focusing on a very important issue, which is actually at the, uh, the, the cog of our future economy, which is SMEs. Thank you all very much. Take care. Uh, mind your distance and be safe and see you again. Bye-bye.